man like a tree is nourished by his roots. His roots grow in different parts of the world. The branches of his family tree spread out over thousands of years and kilometers. But he considers himself a son of the Kazakh land, the land where the nomads of the Great Steppe reached the highest goals. Arman Umarkojev, traveler, historian, archaeologist in the new season of the Kandala project. The ways of folk decorative art are as mysterious as the ways of the Lord. For example, many do not realize that the Kazakh traditional Bizkaste embroidery and French tambour embroidery are closely related. To be honest, I myself did not know about this until recently, but today I hope to learn more with the help of the guest of our program, the incomparable Natalia Bajanova. Like any folk arts and crafts, Bizkaste probably has its own background. Embroidery has very ancient roots. Initially, in a stone age, people used animal skins, and the first stitches craftspeople made were to sew clothes. Of course, the very first tool people used to learn how to sew with was a bone needle, which was made from various bones, including fish. The very fact that people learned how to sew clothes and then wanted to decorate them was the result of their desire to protect themselves and to attract personal well-being. The main point of embroidery was a talisman. Decoration was secondary. Natalia Vazhenova, artist, art critic, senior researcher at the Kastev State Museum of Arts, Kazakh applied arts expert. People believed that a sign, an ornament or some kind of an image could attract well-being and repel negative forces. So, this means that at first people invented the needle to sew something together and then they learned how to embroider with it. And the crochet hook probably appeared later as an improved needle. Who and when came up with the idea of a hook? Who bent the needle and saw that with the help of this so-called gadget you can literally work wonders? People in Kazakhstan knew tambour embroidery and the crochet hook since the Andronova times. Another interesting fact, someone from the French city of Luneville came out with a similar hook. We know it as a Luneville hook today. Before that, they embroidered with a needle. And the traditions of Chinese needlework were very common there. Let's talk about tambour embroidery used in the Kazakh art. Tambour embroidery is a general term. In Kazakh it's called bizkiste, where biz is a tool used to embroider. On the other hand, kiste means drawing, embroidery. And you can see that it's a sort of a drawing. I looked up the meaning of the phrase biz caste and found out that the Kazakh word caste embroidery comes from the ancient Iranian kashte, which means drawn, and biz means needle or hook. Biz is a hook and an owl at the same time, with a miniature spearhead, and the embroidery masters learned to work with it very quickly. We were shooting a short film about tambour embroidery once, and the cameraman even asked the craftswoman to work slowly because the camera couldn't capture her movements. Uh, 
Kilis. Initially, I studied to be an artist. There was a period in my life when I thought about the future of my creative path. One day, I noticed my wife Guljai Kusman singing and embroidering. At first, I got interested in her work. With that emerged the idea to create an original piece. And so, for more than 30 years, with the help of embroidery, I combined my works, Kazakh traditional art, with modern art. The main tool of this technique is a hook. When the foreigners see my work, they do not believe that this is possible. They say that I probably hide the fact that I use some machine tool. But in fact, this is the legacy that we inherited from our ancestors. And we should be grateful to them that we can create big canvases with the help of such a small tool. They had to always be on a horse's back, holding a spear in their hands to protect their land and livestock. And at the same time, our ancestors managed to create such beautiful things. At that time, people lived surrounded by nature, and they simply could not explain how many natural phenomena as we can now. We know why it rains, we know why the wind blows. They didn't back then. They perceived it as something supernatural and thus deified it. And this worldview they communicated in the form of ornaments that accompanied them both outside and inside the house. A yurt is like a small universe. Everything that a person saw around, they took it in and brought into this world of crafts and arts. Our ancestors lived in several dimensions at once – functionality, reliability, beauty and sacredness. A child saw all this beauty, the ornaments, the patterns, from a very early age. Imagine how much their imagination developed. After all, looking at these ornaments, a child could make so many different associations. Craftswomen paid great attention to the power of thought. That is, what thought they had when they embroidered this or that piece. For example, to ski is which is an embroidered wall carpet, an integral part of the bride's dowry, it is also a symbol of general well-being and happiness of the family. The bride's mother, her grandmother and she herself, when embroidering the wall carpet, put positive thoughts in the work. People now often talk about the power of thought, that thoughts can materialize. Our ancestors knew about this a long time ago and put their most positive thoughts into these ornaments. My colleague Konstantin Koksin shared with me an interesting thought, which he also heard from someone else. He said that craftswomen embroidered something, some beautiful ornament, they left some part of it unfinished or deliberately messed up. This was done to prevent the anger of the Almighty for creating such an ideal piece, so as not to be on the same level with him. Scientists found a tuskiis with a small fragment left unembroidered. Why? Did she not have time? No. It turned out that the mother deliberately left a small piece, a fragment unembroidered, so that her daughter could continue it, repeating the pattern. Tuskiis is an integral part of the bride's dowry, and from the earliest age, as soon as she could hold the hook, the girl would learn to embroider. First, she watched her mother and grandmother do the embroidery. Then she was given a chance to try embroidering herself. They gave her a small hoop and she embroidered some element herself. She started with small elements like leaves and flowers and gradually honed her skills. As a result, she had to make herself a wedding to skis, which she then took with her to her new home. You spoke about a master for whom embroidering is a family tradition. 
Зинилхана Мухамеджана, удивительная. Того и, самого. Да, того самого. Это у них вообще династия. Зинилхан Мухамеджан family is amazing. They have a dynasty. Зинилхан Мухамеджан and his daughter Ботагоз specialize in paintings. They make compositions and frame them, while the wife adheres more to traditional items. У них сюжетные композиции, оформленные в раму, а супруга больше придерживается традиционных изделий. This tiskiz is one of the largest in size. It's three meters long and two meters wide. We have followed all the tiskiz traditions. This work is unfinished on one side because the life goes on. We can still add more. Our mothers and grandmothers chose mostly black and red colors, a black ornament on a red background. For this item, I use the technique of applique. I cut out ornaments from red material, attached to black fabric and decorate the edges with embroidery. The base of this work is made of velvet fabric, while the embroidery is continuous. The edges of this piece are decorated with applique. This tiskiz took me nine months to make. This geste is a very painstaking work. It's like digging a well with a needle. I would like to look at the schedule of this great woman of the Kazakh steppe who had enough time to look after her husband, feed the children, sew something and cook food. This topic, her time management skills require a separate study. The craftswoman decorated not only carpets, but also bags that were hung on the inside walls of the yurt, clothes, numerous baskur tapes. They can be 10 to 20 meters long, with embroidery across it all. Baskurs are patterned ribbons used to fasten the frame of the yurt around the entire perimeter. After all, there were strong winds in the steppe, and these patterned ribbons were used to fix the frame of the yurt both from the inside and from the outside to keep the cover from blowing off and the yurt from shaking. If we talk about the features of Kazakh embroidery, how does it differ from others? Embroidery spread throughout the territory of our country at the same time. This involved the great migration of peoples, about which Lev Gumilev and Nicholas Rorich spoke a lot. And these ties between people, border ties, they still exist. There was also the Great Silk Road. We can also recall the Uzbeks who also have tambour embroidery in their craft, which they call Suzani. What are the differences or features between these two? Uzbek Suzane has its own composition, its own plasticity, color and ornamental patterns. That is, looking at Suzane, we can immediately recognize it as Suzane. Embroidery is typical for both Tajik and Karakalpak craftswomen. Kyrgyz craftswomen are also excellent embroiderers, and each of them have their own specifics in terms of the composition, ornamentation, and so on. I noticed your outfit. I don't know what it's called, but it looks very unique. What is it called, and when are you supposed to wear it? This is a Bildimshe skirt. Kazakh women, girls, wore the skirt over their clothes. Bildimshe translates from Kazakh as belt. The Hall of Historical Ethnography at the Central State Museum of Kazakhstan has several interesting exhibits that perfectly fit with the theme of our episode. We asked the archaeologist and restorer Tatiana Krupa to act as our guide. I want to draw your attention to the little girl's costume. The Bildimshe skirt has a stunning work of embroidery in the Bizkestia technique. This is as intricate as a skirt for an adult woman would be. Just imagine this tiny thing walking in such a stunning Bildimshe. 
Here we see samples of adult women's costumes. This is a coat and a dress. The dress is made in a tambour technique. This is very lush embroidery. If you wear it with Kazakh silver jewelry of incredible beauty, it will be so enviably beautiful. I also want to draw your attention to this Chopin coat. It's lined with fur, but the borders and cuffs are embroidered using the Bizkaisté technique. To be honest, I personally fell in love with this Chopin. I wonder if the history preserved the name of at least one great embroiderer. We have signed wall carpets in our archives. That is, a craftswoman has embroidered her name in some ornament. For example, our exposition has a carpet by Maria Ilakhova, who created a beautiful masterpiece at the beginning of the 20th century. The wedding headdress of the bride, Saukile, is usually decorated with coral threads on three of the four sides. Maria Ilakhova took these coral beads out in order to create voluminous flowers on her coral tuskies. To dismantle your saukile in order to weave tuskies requires a special personality, maybe even a fanatic. As if she herself collected bouquets of red coral flowers in the field and scattered them all over the field of Tuskies. I think this work of art was created in winter when the steppe was grey, damp, dreary. But this beautiful carpet was blazing in the home with all these colors of summer. Are there any degrees of complexity to the embroidery? And what degree of complexity can this hook handle? Before us is the work of Zinil Khan Muhammadjan. It is called Khorkhat. We all know that Khorkhat invented the Khobas. And here the artist depicts him with a Khobas in his hands playing on this wonderful musical instrument, the sounds of which are fascinating. According to legend, everything around, the whole living world, froze when Khorkut played this instrument. And here we can see the artist's style. We see how he plays with the shape of Khorkut's body, as well as with Khobas. Look at the decor around. These are camels, a caravan of camels, the Silk Road. These are S-shaped elements that remind us of the Scythian animal style. And if you look closely, Zinil Khan Muhammadjan uses traditional embroidery, fragments from remaining Tuskis carpets, with modern embroidery, playing with traditional motifs. Обыгрывая, посмотрите, современной вышивкой, и здесь мы видим такую связь времен, древность и современность вот в этой вышивке баскисте. Каждый раз, когда я слышу вот это. Every time I hear this famous composition, Corket, I always get this vision of a Kobeshi in my head. I'm now looking at this painting, and this composition plays in my head. This is amazing. It's just some kind of mysticism. Но действительно, когда художник работает над какой-то темой, он полностью погружается в эту тематику, слушает музыку. Indeed, when an artist works on a topic, he completely immerses himself into this topic. He listens to music, he reads. Zinil Khan Muhammadjan says that sometimes ideas come to him spontaneously. Something has already been accumulating in the artist's heart and it requires some kind of an outlet. Do you see any three-dimensionality in this work? What seems to be 3D? The Kobez itself definitely seems to be convex. It's in the foreground. Next comes Korkhet's face. It's secondary. Everything else seems tertiary, quaternary and even quinary. I also see here a wheel. This is a very close to our symbol. And we have on our hands an amazing chain of cultures from different eras and think that our wheel of history needs to make another spin. The name of this work is Childhood. 
As children, we joyfully rode horses across the endless steppe, while at home our mother and sisters embroidered and sang. That time will forever remain in my memory. And every time I start the work, I remember my childhood. This work is called The Sun in the Mountains. In the summer at noon, the sun rises over the mountain and warms everything around. This is such a wonderful moment. What qualities does the art of this caste develop in people? It teaches patience and perseverance. Children are restless. All they want is to play and run around. But here they need to sit still and concentrate so that the pattern would turn out beautiful. And of course, it develops the sense of color. Because before creating a piece, the craftswoman had to lay out the entire palette in front of her. She had to decide on her head which colors should go where. Imagine her thought process. So this is a sort of business card. When the future husband will be choosing himself a wife, he will probably look at what she can do and how she can do it. Certainly, which is why people visited others and looked at the yurt interior. And if there was a girl of marriageable age in the household, Tuskias would have an earring hung on it. When people would come, they would see it and know that there is a girl of marriageable age in this yurt. <laughs> this beautiful headdress, which I have been looking at all this time, what can you say about it? Look at how one ornament intertwines with another. There is even a connection with architecture. All these floral ornaments are typical for Oriental architecture. On what parts of clothes was the tambour embroidery placed? The sleeves, the neck, the hem of the dress. The embroidery could have been placed even on the back, right in the middle. Sometimes the chest area would have been embroidered also. Camisoles or vests would especially have embroidery on the chest area, all over the front and along the edges. It, of course, acted as an amulet. There is such a Kazakh ancient headdress for women called kimishek. It is mainly worn by married or old women. It's made of white fabric and it's very beautifully decorated with embroidery, corals, various beads, which are placed around the entire face area. Stitch by stitch, word by word, we managed to unweave the topic of our conversation and now, I think, it's time for us to visit the famous Kazakh designer Aijan Abdubait and see her collection. This Bildimshe is a reconstruction, the original of which is kept in the Central Museum of Kazakhstan. Aijan, what a beauty! All the ornaments decorating these outfits are calling to visit the flowering Kazakh steppe. Why not? Let's go there! I know that many foreign visitors, including me, go to the souvenir shops and buy these items. Maybe you have noticed that nowadays our youth, especially on Nauruz, puts on vests or other clothing items with ornamented embroidery. Over the past few years, activists have been trying to introduce the Day of National Clothes in Kazakhstan. And I fully support them. 
I too think that we should have such a day just like Nowruz, on which each and every one of us can simply put on national clothes. Natalia, thank you for an interesting conversation and we express our deep gratitude to our artists and craftspeople who are reviving the traditional Kazakh art of this caste. A type of embroidery which paved its way to us from distant countries and he has found a second wind. A wind filled with the energy of a nomadic culture.